Hi, and welcome to the Macro Show. We talk macro, and you wonder, can the stimulus checks actually cause a banking crisis? We're going to answer that question, look at the economic data, go through the banking credit data. We've got a new supporting evidence to say that, yes, possibly these stimulus checks can. We've got a great show lined up for you today. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter. Thanks for joining me today. Now, some of you have wondered, man, it must be really rough being the Bond King today. Let me tell you, my friends, being king is not, not the easiest job in any time. Even in the good times, it's, it's difficult. But look, I may be battered. I may be bruised. But I am here, possibly fried. Don't know. But I still stand before you proudly. Now, many of you have asked, when we get into all that, many of you have asked, do you have a premium newsletter subscription service? I'd like to subscribe. And the answer is I don't. But how about a free one? So that's right. I'll put the link in the description. So I thought I'd write a newsletter, put it out there, see what you think. If you like it, maybe I'll do more. If, if it's not of interest, well, then I won't. Pretty simple with that. All right. So let's let's go back to Wednesday's show. So for those of you who are new to the macro show and you're, and you're trying to understand what's going on, and even those who watched uh, Wednesday show, we kind of need to revisit what's going on just to make sure we're all on the same page. Because when you start to get into the plumbing of how the financial system works, it gets really interesting to see why things can't work. So for example, people are talking about, oh, we're going to have universal basic income. But when you understand the, the problem we're having right now with just these stimulus checks, you understand we can't have universal basic income, not under the current banking regulations. But really the focus is after we go through that is, you know, what is this going to lead to? Is it going to lead to a banking crisis? Will the Fed come to the rescue? Who's going to do what and why? All right, let's start out with the problem. So stimulus, the stimulus bill or recovery bill, whatever, whatever it's being called, was passed, signed by President Biden. And we've heard that checks could be going out this weekend, being deposited potentially this weekend. Now, the banks really don't want this money. Now, I know that seems strange. What do you mean a bank doesn't want money? It's like a Bond King not wanting a crown. That just doesn't make any sense. But the banks don't want the money because after the great financial crisis, there was laws put into place or additional regulations. Predominantly, the, the big one is called Basel III. And what Basel III did is said, look, we're going to limit the size of the bank's balance sheet. Now, what is a balance sheet? It just means their ability to take deposits and loans. And this, it said, look, you, you, we're going to control how big you can get. Because we think you were the problem in the great financial crisis, so we're going to solve it by making sure that you have massive amounts of regulations and can't do crazy things. Now, one of the problems with that is the, these, these regulations never assumed that there would be large uh, asset purchase programs or big quantitative easing programs, nor, now, hey, it could tolerate some, but not huge, huge ones, not like trillion dollar a month ones, it couldn't do that, nor did these banking regulations ever think or the regulars think that hey what if there's large fiscal transfers directly to depositors to consumers see the regulations didn't factor that because what is something that expands the bank's balance sheet deposits and what do we get when people get a stimulus check what do they do with it what's well, the first thing they do they deposit it and the banks say we don't want that we can't it's not that we don't want it by regulation we can't handle it because we can't get any bigger. And if we get bigger, we get severely penalized and then it gets even worse. So what do the banks have to do? Well, they have to get rid of assets. And one of those things they've been getting rid of is treasury securities. At least that's, that was the belief, is specifically the belief which we're going to completely uh, dismiss is that they were dumping 30 years. Not true at all. We're, we're gonna dismiss that, uh, that view altogether. You're gonna see that on the actual uh, New York Fed Day, uh, Fed's website after their data. So you can go check it later if you want. So what did happen after the CARES Act was passed? What, what did Fed Chair Powell do? Now, some of you already know because you've watched, you, you've been a fan of the show for a while, is the Fed went and suspended or, or exempted treasury securities and reserve assets, reserve assets being the byproduct of quantitative easing from the SLR rule to say, look, banks, you don't have to count these assets. And they, and they made that law go from, uh, April 1st of 2020 to March 31st, 2021. And now why did they pick that time range? Because simply probably nobody at the time thought that we would be having direct fiscal stimulus checks a year from now. Not probably not one person believed that. And yet here we are. And so all of a sudden, we have a new administration in office. They have $1.6 trillion in the government bank account and they passed 
a $1.9 trillion stimulus package with big checks to consumers and the banks are saying, we don't want this. And that's, again, comes back to these banking regulations. So what did we first see now is, if we go and look at some of the evidence to support that, uh, here's the primary dealer treasury positions fall by most on record as swap spreads, sp the swap spreads widen. That swap spreads is in the black line. We're not worried about that, but you can see they, the primary dealer banks dumped a bunch of treasury securities. Now we can look at a different view of this, which is a lot easier to digest. And you can see the primary dealers starting in 2019 were holding massive amounts of treasury securities. So this was before the SLR exemption came into place. It was, wasn't even a factor. The SLR exemption came into place here in 2020, not back in 2019. It was in, it was in place in 2019. So the, the actual SLR rule, there was no exemption. The exemption came in here. And you can see treasury holdings in two years are red and blue. And we're going to look at this in a more granular state. But one thing I want to point out in black is greater than 11 years. And that would be 20s and 30s. And I want you to notice that not only has there been a relatively steady increase, but since early 2020, there's been no big dumping of long bonds. In fact, they're right within their normal, you know, kind of slightly to the low end of their range. So let's go and say, where did you get this data, Steve? Well, I got it from the New York Fed's website. And we can, well, let's look at T-bills real quick, because there's some interesting stuff going on here that banks shed, you know, 24 billion worth of T-bills. Now that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tell you, I don't understand exactly all the mechanics here. I think what we understand if we're understanding the chessboard. So we understand that, look, the banks can't take all of these assets. Now we're trying to figure out what some of the moves they're making and why. Now, I don't understand why they would have done T-bills specifically because they need that. And some of you remember from my inter uh, interviews with Jeff Snyder of Alhambra Partners, you know, he talked about how the banks needed T-bills as pristine collateral. So you would, you would get the impression that this is not something they would be dumping. Now, keep in mind, dumping T-bills on the market isn't going to move the long bonds. So if you're thinking like, ah, that makes sense, nah, T-bills nah, aren't going to influence the long rate. Now let's look at coupons. Now this is kind of where it gets a bit interesting because you can see to your notes, uh, they're, they're down a bit. Now you can look at history of this and download it if you want to play around with it. But look at two to three year. Well, I mean, look, even the two year of 50 billion, I mean, they're not, it's not like they dumped a ton of these this year. I mean, they're at 50 billion. I mean, down from the peak of 60, above the peak of 36. So it's not a ton of dumping here. You see it in the, in the bills, but not here in the twos. How about two to three? And you see, well, they're at, 7.2 billion, they've been as low as five, as high as 14. Okay, so they're down a little, but not like super low. How about we move over to the three to six year? All right, well, now we see something that, that tells us there's a potential problem of what they're dumping, which is the five year bonds or five year notes. And, you know, going from peak of 37 down to 12. So you can kind of clearly see, okay, now we're at the lowest point this year. Yeah, okay, that make you know, we see that. Now, how about we get into the sevens and you say, well, not totally dumping sevens. I mean, high of at one point, almost 11, low at negative 645. They're at 6.4. Oh, yeah, nothing terrible. Now, remember that this is interesting to me is this is that 10 year note shortage, right? We've talked about how there, hey, there's a shortage of 10 year notes. Well, there you see it, three minus three billion. So the dealers have a negative 3 billion in 10 year notes. That tells you how big the short interest is in the 10 year. It's huge, you can see it right here. Now, as we get into the long bond, you see, okay, well that's 45, it's kind of to the low end, but they've had, if we go back and look, they, they've had less at 41 and they've had more at 58, but they've been right in this range. So if we were seeing a dump in, of 20s and 30s, we would see it here. But instead, we're not seeing them dump the long bond at all, which is interesting. We're seeing the tenure getting hammered. Now, if you if you understand that the rates on the long end of the curve move together, that hammering the tenure will definitely affect the long bond. Absolutely. Now, there is some theory that perhaps this is evidence of an operation twist coming, that okay, the banks are deliberately unloading T-bills, 
because they need, they're anticipating the Fed coming in and operating twisting on the long bond, which would do a swap of uh, like 30 years with T-bills. Possibly, I, you know, I, I don't know if there's enough evidence to completely support that, but there's something going on here. Now, we also know that the Fed renewed its quantitative easing as scheduled. It looks just like it did before, so no change with that. So what are the ramifications here? Because we haven't heard any answers from the Fed. None. Now, last time, after the CARES Act, a matter of days later, the Fed exempted treasuries and, rep and reserve assets from the SLR. They did that. Now, quiet, no answer. As we dig into this, what we find out that the, extending the SLR exemption won't actually fix the whole problem. That's how bad it is. I mean, the bank balance sheets, I mean, they can, they can get a little bit bigger, but they are maxed out. I want you to think of this, if, if you're familiar with the, a, a bird, when a bird eats, it fills up its gullet, right? It, it, it gets real big and then it digests it slowly. Think of the banks like a bird who just ate a ton of food. Their gullet is stuffed. They can't take any more without get, getting rid of something. That's what we're seeing here. So let's say, for example, the Fed doesn't do anything. Now, now just so we understand each other, the Fed is a banking regulator. So guess what they have the authority to do? Fix regulatory problems. So that's not, so it's not that they can't fix it, but let's say they don't do anything. Let's say there's a, at the end of the FOMC meeting next week, there's no comment about it, no change. And at the end of the month, the SLR, SLR exemption expires. We're already hearing from the large banks that they're going to their large institutional clients and putting a cap on deposits and preparing them for negative rates. What would then happen as more of these checks start coming in from the stimulus package, customer deposits uh, accounts would start getting shifted over into money market accounts. Now, if you remember from, I think a couple weeks ago, we did a, a review of the US Treasury's quarterly report where we know Janet Yellen has said that she believes the T-bill rates can go negative even as she's cutting T-bill supply to the market. And then we see the banks dropping 25 billion. So you see some things there that don't really add up. Well, could you imagine if money market rates broke the buck and went negative? Where now people have money deposited in banks and are earning a negative interest. Now I'm not suggesting it's be negative 20%, it could be just negative 0.1 or negative a quarter, just could be something small enough but material enough that we actually have negative deposit rates in the United States. This would cause outright panic. Because if you do you remember the last time money market rates went negative, do you remember when that was? Yeah, it's called the great financial crisis. And they briefly went negative and it shook the system. Because what, you, know, you understand the psychology of this, you know, if, if Americans wake up one morning and find out they're being charged deposit money in the banks, what will happen to their confidence of the banking system? It will literally go uh, I would say like yields down, but that's not the case. It would literally go straight down to the bottom. People would panic because what it would tell you is there are severe problems in the banking system. Well, hey, there actually are. There are severe problems with the regulatory framework within the banks that are operating because they can't handle all these deposits. People would lose confidence. The banks would likely stop acting as intermediaries as we saw during uh, the liquidity crisis last March, because they, wouldn't, they would not want to lend because they've got all this money going on. They have the, too many problems. And what, would ha what happened to stocks? What would happen to real estate? Yeah, you can imagine. Confidence, boom, it would go down, forcing then the Fed to act. So I think in the end, you'll see the Fed act because they have no choice. Because if there is a big event that happens, right? I want you to think about this. If there's a big event that happens and we know for a fact it's an issue with regulation, do you think Congress will not drag the head of the Fed, Jerome Powell, in front of them at some point in the future after all this debacle goes wrong? Because when you, what's gonna happen to the stimulus if people's confidence in the banking system is eroded? Are they gonna go out and spend? No, they're gonna turn into massive savers. Are they gonna go out and borrow money? No, because the banks aren't gonna to wanna to lend to them and they're not gonna to want to either. It's literally going to destroy this whole stimulus package. It will not be stimulative at all. And the economy, which is in a very weak state due to the persistent high unemployment claims, would be in dire shape. 
And Fed Chair Powell would probably likely be the very first Fed chair to ever be forcibly removed from office because Congress is simply going to say, we had a regulatory problem. Yeah, we did. And you're the, he and you're the head regulator and you did nothing. So what is Fed Chair Powell likely to do between now and the end of the month? It could happen anytime. Could happen this weekend. Could happen the FOMC meeting. Could happen after. He's likely to extend the SLR exemption. That won't be enough. They're going to have to do more. Though one of the problems is in the short run, is nobody wants more to ease banking regulations, but he has no choice. And he's just gonna simply have to blame it on Congress or stimulus or something to say, look, I didn't wanna do this either, but under the current existing framework, we can't have this. We need to get money out of the banks, either from form of share buybacks or get people to buy bonds or do something, anything. Because what is, you know, do you, what is the real crux of this problem, right? The bank balance sheets. And what, how did they get so big? QE, not because QE puts money into the, into the bank balance sheets, because QE needs expanding bank balance sheets. It drives rates down so low that people put money in cash. And then what's the secondary problem? See, Americans don't like buying treasury securities. They don't like buying our own debt. They like, but hey, with stocks is where it's at. You know, other people afford it. Yeah, they can buy all our treasury stuff. We, we don't want to buy that stuff. We don't want to buy our own debt. It's not worth anything. We want to buy stocks. Well, see, the system, my friends, needs to be balanced. And when you don't have balance in the system, it starts to get lopsided, which is usually how recessions occur when you have way too much money on one side of the fence, whether in stocks or real estate or whatever. The problem now is the Fed knows that Americans don't want to buy treasury securities. So what does it do? It forces them to. Yeah, that's right. You and me, you, you have, do you have money deposited in the bank? Well, guess what? That money is probably tied somewhere to a treasury security. So, they're f so the Fed, by doing quantitative easing, is forcing Americans to buy its own debt. And there's a massive negative penalty for that. And you're seeing that right now. Now, there's some things that also don't make a lot of sense to me is, Okay, so we see the dealer banks are not shedding treasury securities. And every time these things sell off, their buyers come into the market. Well, let's quickly take a look. And I normally, we'll probably go over this again on Monday when we have some charts from um, Brent and Stefan to look at. But look at the dealer positioning on the long bonds. You know, they actually reduced their short position. Look at leverage funds. They reduce their short position. This is a Tuesday. Do you think they would massively increase it? How about the ultra bond? Well, the, the dealers increase their short position a little bit, but speculators decrease. So where, the, where is really the short position going on? Well, check out the two-year increase, 152,000 contracts. How about the 10-year, 99,000 contracts? Wow. And then you have the ultra 10 plus 15. I mean, so you're seeing some interesting stuff going on here. And it all tells me, that the long bond isn't dead because dealer positioning says they want the long bond. You look at, or the commercial bank position says they're still long, long the long bond. Speculators aren't going even shorter. You'd think they would. And the dealers are holding on to them. Pretty interesting. All right, let's take a look at the economic data. Uh, we've got initial jobless claims. I hope that was really helpful and really kind of understanding where all this is at. Uh, let's take a look at jobless claims. I think for the 51st week in a row, we're at over 700,000 claims. Uh, this is not what you expect in an economic recovery. We should be adding tons of jobs, not having you know 700,000 claims. I mean, normal is two to 300,000, you know, closer to the two number. Uh, this is way too high. Look at this pandemic claims, total unemployment claims up uh, over 2 million to 20.116 million Americans. You know, something, you know, what you're seeing is, you know, fundamental problems with the economy that are not being solved by a vaccine. How about the 30 year treasury auction? You know, some people said this was terrible. It wasn't, it was actually quite good. Uh, when we look at this, what do we see going on in the, in the 30 year auction? We see foreign bidders uh, bid a little bit less, but domestic bidders bid a little bit more. Dealers only picked up 4.6 billion. Remember the Fed is buying specifically 10 and a half billion of 30 year treasuries per month. Perhaps why the dealers are holding on to them. That means they're short this month by 5.9 billion. So that's kind of interesting. Bid to cover was a little below the six month average, but not terrible at 2.28%. What else we have in the economic data that's worth? Oh, the PPI data. I wanna look at that. Producer prices up 0.5%, year over year up 2.8. Core, which is excluding food and energy, up 0.2, year over year up 2.5. Now, now I wanna to explain to you what the squeeze at the margin is doing. So what we're seeing is producers, producer prices are rising faster than consumer prices. 
So, so what, how do we translate that into something that make, maybe makes sense to you? So let's say that you're a retailer and you buy an item for $10 and you sell that item to your customers for 20. That's pretty good margin, right? $10 profit. Now all of a sudden the price of that item goes to 15 because producer prices went up. So they raise their prices. So you buy it for 15, mark it up to 30 and you can't sell it. But you drop the price down and find out that your customers that were paying 20 will now pay 22. So instead of making a $10 profit, you're making a seven. Think of now, instead of putting that as a retail position, put that at the manufacturing position and that's where the manufacturers are at. Their input costs are going up and they can't pass it out, the, the full cost out the door the other end, which means they are still making a profit, but not as big. And meanwhile, people are piling into stocks thinking all these companies are gonna make lots and lots of money on inflation. Let's take a look at the uh, banking data here. This is pretty interesting stuff as well. Uh, bank credit, what do we see? Rose, 28 billion. Securities and bank credit up nine. Mortgage-backed securities up 10. U.S. Treasuries down 10. Uh, there it is, down 10. Now, what's interesting about U.S. Treasuries is it looks like they peaked out at uh, 1.245 billion in February. And so they're only down, what, 30 billion, which isn't, you know, you think about that in the big picture, the Fed's buying 80 billion of these things a month. So the fact that the banks are down 30 billion isn't to me a sign that they're dumping treasury securities. Obviously what we saw at the dealers was a different story. How about loans and leases up 18 billion, commercial industrial up 10, total real estate, residential and commercial down one. And this is a big boy, it's the biggest one here. And that is really critical. How about consumers, surprisingly they're up. Uh, 5 billion, most of that on credit cards. I have a hunch that that will be reversed when stimulus checks come out. But how about cash assets? Now you would think this number would be printed after the checks went out, but check this out. Cash at banks, up 126 billion. You know, that's not a sign of an economic recovery yeah, at all. Let's, let's hit the PowerPoints real quick. We got real estate loans, uh, real estate loan growth down to 0.04% from year, year ago. So what does that tell you? On a year over year basis, no money being created by real estate, none. This is a problem you know, when you have you know, the Fed behaving the way they're doing, potentially creating a credit contraction by letting rates go up. Six month rate of change is negative, three month rate of change is negative and rising. Let's look at commercial industrial loans. Uh, they're down to 10.28 from a year ago, but due to that big spike, this will get washed out by the end of March. Six and three month rate of change are negative, but improving. How about loans and leases, all commercial banks? So growth rate is down to 2.65% from a year ago. So if you're looking for inflation, this is money creation. So we've only seen money creation at 2.65% from a year ago. This is very, very weak. Normally you need to see this number up in the five you know, six, seven, eight percent range. Six month rate of change is negative. Three month rate of change is slightly positive. How about consumer loans? Credit card growth growth rate, even though we saw a, a three billion increase on credit cards, the growth rate is still down minus thirteen percent from a year ago. My prediction is you're going to see consumers paying down and paying off credit cards with stimulus checks. But we're going to talk about on Monday how these stimulus checks are actually likely to be deflationary. And I think that'll kind of blow you away. Plus, you know, when you see these higher rates, you see this uncertainty, what's going on with Fed. Um, there's, it's not going to instill confidence in the economy at a time where it really needs it. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter. Thanks for joining me today. Be sure to check out the free newsletter. Uh, I'll link it in the description below. See you on Sunday for the Chart Show, Monday on the Macro Show. Bye now. The content of this video is provides educational information. It's not intended to provide investment or other advice. It's not to be construed as recognition or solicitation by social security, financial independent, or participate in any particular training strategy. This video was paired by Steam Van Meter, post capacity, pins express this video that do not reflect the view of Atlas Financial Advising or Steam Van Meter Financial.